Well, on the matter of 1 John 3, 9. I like the New King James Version. I bracketed in each one who has been born of God does not sin. For his, God's seed remains in him and he cannot sin because he has been born of God. We've already looked at this. Uh, cannot sin. Can you say as a believer you cannot sin? Can, can you say as a believer you don't sin occasionally? Of course, truthfully, you can't claim to be without sin or have not sinned. 1 John 1, 8 and 10. So, whether you have that truth or not, you can't claim to be without sin. Most charismatics and perseverance and uh, lordship salvationists don't say, well, I'm, I'm perfectly without sin now. Just watch me. No. no they, they admit they have their faults occasionally or uh, even they have great moments of sinless perfection, but they can't say they're perfect. So if sinless perfection on the part of the child of God, born of God, his entirety, both sin and born of God natures, is in view in 1 John 3, 9. Some say it is. Then there would be not be a need for much of God's word. Okay, I did this at Calvary Chapel one time. I took a pew Bible. I put my hand around the letters at the end of the New Testament there, right? I said, then you don't need these. And I pretended to rip them out. Oh, don't do that. He, I convinced him. I said, well, then what are they doing there for if they're not, if you're, if you're a sinless perfection achiever? Obviously, he said, well, I got your point. Leave the church. Okay, so I didn't get much accomplished there. But I made my point. So it's in view, then there would be not be a need for much of God's word, only passages which lead up to and include salvation. Thereafter, one's becoming a child of God, born of God, would be perfect without a need to exhort to abide in Christ. But such cannot be the case unless major portions of God's word are misleading and contradictory. Even the ones that give you the gospel say it's by grace and it's through faith and it's not of yourselves. So they say, well, yeah, it's grace through faith, not of yourselves, but then when you get saved, you're perfect. Well, then we go back to, well, you better just take out your all those passages in the Bible that God made a mistake and put in there to admonish the believer when he goes awry the, the, what he needs to do. Confess and move on. Right? Repent from that behavior. And so on. Thereafter, one's become a child of God, born of God, would be perfect without a need to exhort to abide in Christ. But such cannot be the case unless major portions of God's word are misleading and contradictory. Listen to it again. Each one who has been born of God does not sin. For his God's seed remains in him. And he cannot sin because he has been born of God. Now the inner nature cannot sin, so the outer nature sins. But Paul doesn't say that one does the good and the other does the evil. Does he? He's saying he's losing the battle to the evil. When you act, you act in accordance with who you are. At the moment, if the sin nature you've allowed to dominate your thinking and actions, then you're sinful. The other guy inside of you, the, the, the new nature, is uh, shuddering and locked up into the closet, right? That doesn't make sense. If sinless perfection on the part of the child of God, born of God, is in view in 1 John 3, 9, then there would not be a need for much of God's word, only passages which lead up to and include salvation. There would be a very small Bible. Thereafter, the born of God experience, the child of God, born of God, would be perfect with no need for instruction, correction, forgiveness of temporal sins, and so on. So all of the passages exhorting believers to grow in the word and abide in the righteousness of the Lord would be of no value, even in error. Come on, what do you... you I, what do you take me for? I'm a perfect being now. God, you just made me into a perfect sinless per being. Just like when the new covenant is fulfilled with all Israel, believing in the one and only Jesus Christ coming in his second coming, they will be transformed into perfect human beings. You're not partaking of that fulfillment of the new covenant. It's with the house of Israel and the house of Judah together at the moment of faith alone and Christ alone. They've had their opportunities over the centuries and they'll be once again God's chosen people. Perfect human beings. Sinlessly perfect. 
and know the word of God perfectly, live hundreds and hundreds of years, that's not you or I. Although sinless perfection of the entire child of God is claimed by some to happen automatically at the spiritual birthing experience, all the passage, passages which admonish the child of God not to behave like the world, such as 1 John chapter 2 and Romans chapter 6, would then be misleading one to think that a true believer could practice sin. So if children of God, born of God, do not and cannot sin, then all of these oft-ignored passages must be expunged from God's Word, including most of the New Testament epistles. Here. Let me give you some help. Here's the scissors. Start cutting the passages out. Go ahead. You won't have much to read. Left over. You're perfect. But don't start telling other people that on the street and look at you like you're nuts. But such is not the case. Children of God, born of God, do sin and must remedy that situation by what God has provided for when they do sin. Look at it. 1 John 7 to 1 John 2, 2. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light. These are, we're talking about believers. We have fellowship with one another. You have to walk in the light of Christ. Why? You're perfect. Why don't you have your own light? One equals God with another, with each of we believers walking in the light. And the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. If we should say that we have no sin, 1 John 1, 8, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. So you can't all along in the Christian life say, well, I have no sin now because you're a liar. How about if we confess our sins, we don't need this verse. If we confess our sins, we don't have any sins, right? He is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins, the one we confess, <coughs> ones, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Well, that verse needs to be expunged. No, don't take it out. It's very valuable for me. I'm constantly falling short of the glory of God. Aren't you? 1 John 1.10 If we, believers, just remember, 1 John 1.3 1 John 1.3 This book, 1 John is written. What we have seen, heard, we proclaim, proclaim to you also that you may, that you too may have fellowship with us, and indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son Jesus Christ. Okay, and then go all the way down to one John two two. My one John two one. My little children, who are those? We're believers. This book is written to believers. You can read it and snip out little verses and satisfy your own uh, editorial desires, which is, not, well, you shouldn't do that to the Word of God. Um, but this is to believers. And this gives you an idea of the capacity of we believers. So, 1 John 1 9. If we should say that we have not sinned, 1 John 1 10, we make him, God, out to be a liar, and his word is not in us. So you can't look back in your Christian life and say, well, the whole time since I became a believer, I hardly sinned at all, and now I'm at the point where I haven't sinned. Who's a liar? You and God. You make him out to be a liar as well as yourself. Remember 1 John 2, 1, My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. And why would he say that if you could? couldn't? And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. So in the Christian life, you're an advocate with the Father because he's your Savior, Christ. And he'll provide for you cleansing from your unrighteousness in this temporal life, moment to moment, simply by confessing. Notice it's all by God's grace and not by your perfect doing, even for moments at a time. You say, well, Jesus, I don't need you for this moment. You need him 24-7. And 1 John 2, 2, he, Jesus Christ, is the propitiation himself for our sins and not for ours only, but also for those of the whole world. A little note here. Who did, for whom did Christ die? Everyone. All sins are paid for. Really? Yeah. No one has a sin problem when they go to judgment. Great white throne judgment. God's going to say, you have a sin problem? No, he's not. But do you have the righteousness of Jesus Christ? Are you good enough to get into heaven on your own auspices? You didn't believe in Jesus and get appropriated to you the righteousness of Jesus Christ. So that God could say, you're qualified, I'll change you into a perfect human being. Welcome into heaven's shores. No, you make it all the way through, though. You miss the rapture. You stay on the planet or die earlier. And you get raised from the dead in your same old sinful self. 
we get raised from the dead or raised and, and transformed into life at the rapture into a perfect human being. But you won't get that if you haven't trusted in Christ. So now you've got to be good enough to get into heaven. And the more you've sinned all your life, the worse kind of person you become. And you'll stay that way? I don't want to be around myself. Really don't. After today, the day yesterday, the day before, my f failings, my flaws, I'm looking forward to being that perfect, sinless perfect person transformed into a resurrection body like Christ and, and wanting, desiring with all my heart and soul to serve the Lord in perfection and not even thinking of a sinful thought, word, or deed. Moved away and, and enjoy the presence of Christ in my life for the rest of eternity and you fellow believers. So, point five, the inner man, the new nature of the child of God, born of God, albeit without sin, is not singularly in view in 1 John 3, 9. Shocker. A lot of theologians think this, but you don't have a schizophrenic nature. Paul said in Romans 7, we'll look at that, that Paul keeps losing to the sin nature within him. Well, the inner man wants to do these good things and can't motivate you to participate in what the inner man wants you to do. And who's, who's prompting the inner man? The Holy Spirit within you. You've got God in you, and yet you keep losing the battle because Paul does. And are you better than Paul? There is no change in context to this effect in either of these verses or anywhere in 1 John. The context is the whole believer, not a part of him and a part of them fighting within each other, within you. Hence, the only interpretation left is that 1 John 3, 9 refers to the Son of God in his perfect sinless humanity. I might say, I want to write them only to the Son of God in his perfect sinless humanity. Only, not you. You're not qualified yet. You will be. Who does not and cannot sin. The message of this verse is for the child of God, born of God, to emulate the Son of God, who is wholly born of God without sin. The only one, the only human being on the planet, until you get resurrected in your resurrection body. So 1 John 3, 9, the inner man of those who have died to Christ, Romans 6, 8, 7, 14 to 25. In other words, believers in Jesus Christ, Romans 1 to the end, is only a part of the child of God, born of God, that part which has been born of God, that part that singularly wants to do good, never evil, that cannot sin, who keeps himself and the evil one cannot touch him. The inner man is also described by the Apostle Paul as the law of my mind. And we'll look at these. Yet the inner man is nevertheless only part of the child of God, born of God, the believer, who still has that flesh, the flesh, the sin, evil dwelling ever present in the members of his body, as the Apostle Paul wrote about in Romans chapter 7. It's hard. Confess and move on. And recognize and accept the grace of God purifying you from all unrighteousness. We just read that, 1 John 1 9, right? Let's go back to 1 John 1 9. Reminding yourself this is your daily thought. If we, believers, confess the sins we've committed, our sins, He is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Brother, sister, you have a clean slate for the next moment until you sin again and keep confessing. It makes you kind of humble, doesn't it? You realize you've done some great things for the Lord. Circumstances, I see the Lord walking in my life, providing for me things that I can respond to faithfully or unfaithfully. And whatever it is going to be, if I confess the shortcoming, cleanse us from all unrighteousness and move on and say, Lord, thank you. Next, next task. Go back to studying the Bible. When you study the Bible, I get all excited. When can I use these verses? 1 John 3, 9. I've already used them since I've been on them if we're doing YouTubes. Okay. Hence, the born of God, inner man, cannot be singularly in view in 1 John 3, 9 or 1 John 5, 18, which is... Uh, a stepchild, 1 John 5, 18. Same, same verse, pretty much. Read it. We know, we know that no one who is born of God sins. Well, that can't be us. But he who, has, well, he who was 
born of God. See, 